Welcome to another The Next Up podcast. I'm your host, PC747. This podcast pretty much talk about the latest trends, what's going on in Android and tech. Heavy sender on Android. And today's topic is basically that. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about what's going on with Google. In fact, my lineup for right now, I have three things I want to talk about. The Pixel 4 is pretty much out right now, and I want to kind of dive in deep into my thoughts on that i got something i want to say on that we got a new thing to talk about stadia you know and we want to go into that as well as talking about lte and what we kind of expected now that t-mobile and sprints merger has been improved guys i am feeling so much better this week you know last week i had a cold i struggled to get through you know i was actually listening to my podcast um that was filmed last week and yeah I, <laughs> I was struggling to get through it you know, I uh, came back from L.A., had a good time on my trip, enjoyed the Lakers game, enjoyed the weather out there, beautiful bird bank. And, you know, when I came back, you know, uh, went to work, and I thought, man, you know, maybe what was going on is that that post-vacation blues, when you first get back from vacation, you go back to work, you kind of still, you know, feel a little bit of fatigue. You, 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 it's Monday, you're kind of dragging your feet, trying to get – motivation going I kind of thought that okay that was kind of what's going on and then you know when Tuesday got there and Wednesday I kind of started to feel more and more of the, the sickness the you know the coughing and the sneezing and you know when you got a cold you know you want to uh, take some medicine that will kind of get you a chance to give you some rest and you know I couldn't do that especially with my hours that I work so you know I just kind of you know just dealt with it and I couldn't wait till um Finally got off from work, took some night quill, got some rest, but I really wanted to film that show or, or film the uh, podcast last week. So I, you know, I, I just pushed through it and, you know, I, I'm glad I did, you know, I had a, a good time with it, but yeah, you know, just right afterwards, I just finished getting some rest and kind of got the rest out of me. So right now I'm actually feeling much, much better. You know, the cold is pretty much out of me for, for the most part, you know, um, uh, started this morning off with the gym, got a nice little workout, got going and yeah. And, you know, didn't feel any issues, no runny nose or anything. I think only thing I have left is, you know, uh, some stuff in my throat that's kind of still coming up. But other than that, man, it, 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 it's a good day. It's a good day. To talk about tech and man, I, I can't wait to get started. And but let's go ahead and get started talking about the pixel four. So look, the pixel four is out now. You can go out and get it. I talked about it last week. It's been out for a couple of weeks, and there's been like a lot of people talking about it on uh, YouTube and everywhere. You know, I'm pretty sure right now the, the pressing topic right now is the Pixel Four because really, let's be honest, there are two phones that I feel like really uh, set the trends that you know spurn up the conversation, and that is the iPhone and Google phone, which is the Pixel, and. Right now, a lot of people are interested in it because there has been a buildup of the Google phone, the Pixel, the Nexus for a while now. And there's been a movement of people like me who just love that phone. We've been hyping the phone up for years and years. And, you know, we're starting to see more people kind of build up on that. And really, the trend setting, the needle mover every year is either iPhone for Apple fans or the Pixel for Google fans. You know, even though we have other phones out there, the Note, the OnePlus, which have their fan base that is continuing to grow. You know, you got LG out there, which is kind of more dying. You got some of your gaming phones that's kind of starting to build up people. But at the end of the day, the one phone that's going to continue to push the needle it's Google's phone, and rightfully so. So it's no surprise that you go everywhere, everyone has an opinion on this phone, and, you know, that is the thing that is getting the ratings, that is the thing that getting the clicks, and with more carriers carrying this phone, you have more of an opportunity, more of an option to go about picking this phone up. 
And now that the phone is available for more people to pick up, you know, you would think that this would be the phone that people would want to pick up. And you have people on both sides kind of talking about it. But the main consent of it is disappointment, especially for the Pixel 4. You know, the battery life, this this phone is just have some problems. And for me, you know, this bring me to my, my, my issue with this phone. Because me being a fan of the Nexus Pixel phones, we gravitate to this because we want a true competitor to the iPhone. We've been begging for this really back since the iPhone was released. And we've seen many phones come out there that can do it. But we really want, and when I say we, we as hardcore Android phones that want that pure Android phone, we are looking for an iPhone competitor. Because the one thing that Apple continues to do right, you know, as much as I hate to admit it, they got the hardware, the software, and all of that done right. And we want that on our end. Now, I'm not saying Apple put out the most top line of specs. No, but the overall package, the performance, just top of the line. And one of the things that Apple and Apple fans continue to be able to boast that is that at the end of the day, and really since the birth of Android, it's taken a lot more hardware on the Android end to be able to step up and be really close to the level or be able to compete what Apple has been able to do. Because if you look at the iPhone for years, it's never been on the same par if you look at as far as hardware, step for step. We have always continued to just be ahead of them when it comes to hardware, especially after we got to the point where we started seeing a lot of these bigger phones such as the uh, Thunderbolt, you know, or the Evo, where we started putting, you know, bigger screens, start throwing the, the RAM at it, start throwing the multiple processors at it because we needed to do that because of the way Android ran just to make it to where we can get it to where it can be as smooth as what iOS has been able to do. Now, in doing that, and the innovation that was burned from that, we've seen Android phones do just so much. It is why, for me, I'll continue to be more excited for Android phones than that of the iPhone. But even though I've been excited for a lot of these phones, you know, even with Samsung and the Notes, I continue to be excited about what they push there. What continues to have me gravitate to Android, and I say Android, uh, to pure Google Android, the Pixel, is that I want the software that Google basically brought or built for their phones. I want that experience that iPhone users have. That experience of an Android system that is not touched by the carriers. Where we get software updates continually Without interference. Because at the end of the day, that really is why Google phones such as the Pixel, the Nexus have been popular among fans like myself. Because when it comes to phones like the Note and all the way back to the Motorola Joy, it has been disturbed by the carriers. When a software update is released for Android, you know, because when Google put out pure Android software update. The greatest example is Android Q. Google put that software out a couple months ago where anybody can update it. Yet, when you look at phones like the Samsung Notes, uh, LG's phone, all these other manufacturers out there, they're not updating their phones to that latest software, even though you have it available for people to, to put it on their phones. So people like myself, the only way we were able to get that latest update was we had to rely on custom ROMs. In other words, we had to rely on some basement or backyard developer to take this software and put it out for us to use. And when we did use it, it wasn't as you know smooth. It wasn't working the way we wanted it to. And the only way you can get the smoothest experience, the best experience for that, was if you had a phone that was straight from Google. That basically is why we gravitate to Google phones. Because we want that same software experience 
that update, all of that things that make really what we want in a phone that we hope will be a true competitor to the iPhone. And that was for me when Google said that they were going to the Pixel lineup, they were going to charge a little bit more. I felt, okay, we finally going to get a true competitor to the iPhone. We finally going to get Google willing to go all the way out and willing to put the money behind a phone to give us a phone that matched the iPhone both in putting out one of the top devices that can really meet them head to head. But the reality is, and really kind of my frustration that continues to be with Google is the simple fact that we haven't seen it. Even since the first Pixel phone that came out, we have yet to see a phone that Google put out there that was on par with the iPhone that was out there. Not yet. And I, I've actually seen people come out and say that this phone is meant to, comp meant to compete with the iPhone, meant to be competitive with the iPhone. If you look what the iPhone is charging, if you look what the, the specs that the iPhone have, well, if you look at what we got on the Pixel 4, it's a better, you know, it got better specs and at a cheaper price. Except for one issue that you could, people that say that it's missing. The way iOS is built as far as software, it is able to perform well on a lesser hardware device because of the way Apple code their software. It's just the way the software is built. It's not meant to continue to run in the background. It's not meant to run uh, multiple programs at the same time. The way it works is it's running one program at a time. When it's done with this program, it runs this one. That's it. Android has always been built on multitasking. It's always been building on where you can run multiple apps at a time. Period. So, yes, that is why in a way, even though these phones are competitors, as far as their software, it's like apples and oranges. They're not really the same. They don't run programs the same. And that is why, at the end of the day, when it comes to Android phones, we've always needed a little bit more hardware to be able to provide a better experience than that on an iPhone because the way the software works is we're running more programs at a time. Meaning, basically, when you go from app to app on an iPhone, it basically stops and then continues on. Where with an Android phone, you're able to switch smoothly because the other app and everything is running in the background. So when you're ready to use it, it's ready to go without any latency. Period. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, it took years to get to that point because, yes, you know, as Android continue to evolve, they continue to uh, code better. They continue to have to evolve to what apps would come into the app store, multiple phones, because again, the reason why it's apples and oranges, because you got on Android more phones running multiple uh, or different software, different hardware, different screen sizes, you know, there's just so much more going on and it has to be able to work on each one of them smoothly without a problem. So we understand that when it comes to Android, it's built for multiple phones. It's supposed to work well on each device. And this is where each manufacturer, uh, software engineers, will actually take Android and code it to where it works smoother on their phone than any other phone. And in a way, it's partly why you do see some uh, time difference from when Google dropped their software updates for their Pixel for we, us to use it, and for when you get it for something like a note or something like that. Because engineers need to code it to make sure all of their scans and all that stuff works smooth on your on your end as you being a user. Now, me, one of the problems I continue to point or at something like Samsung is that Back in the day, I get it. You know, when Google dropped the software, that was the only time you had the opportunity to grab it, you know, and do your development for it. But for years now, Google have been dropping developer um, previews so that you can download it and use it early and start preparing yourself for that. Meaning, in reality, when Google dropped their software update, their official build, whether it be like Android PQ, whatever, for their Pixel, 
you literally, Samsung, LG, or whoever, that manufacturer literally can drop theirs pretty much around the same time because they're getting the opportunity to develop a code on pretty similar software. So really, at the end of the day, there's really no excuse. But the reality is that there is a challenge to why we as customers cannot get the latest software updates to our phone because there is there are other factors at play. For example, even if Samsung was to say, hey, we finally got everything working, we got it right, we're ready to drop the software update, they actually got to go through the carriers and the carriers got to decide when they want to push that update to their customers. And a lot of carriers, they're going to sit on it. One, well, because at the end of the day, they use it as a as a way to sell more phones. If there's a brand new phone that is about to come on the horizon, they're not going to kick out a software update for an older phone. They're going to want to hold that to force by, uh, customers to buy this new phone because they may feel like their old phone is slowing down, lagging, don't have the newer thing that the new phone has. So they want to have this window where they can get as many customers willing to buy this new phone as possible. Then once that kind of slows down, then they're willing to put out a software update. And really, that is for a big, well, that, that is why for me, uh, or a lot of us Android users, why we just do not like uh, a lot of these manufacturers out there that are not, or a lot of these phone companies out there that are interfering with this. And why for me, again, I gravitate to a Pixel phone. Because like Apple, and one of the things that I will continually give Apple kudos for is they do not allow carriers to interfere in their software, period. This is going to be how the iPhone is going to be released. And if you're not going to release it the way we want it, we will pull our phone from your your carrier. We don't need you. You need us. And Apple have stood by that since the beginning. Despite kind of, you know, how I may feel about that, how some customers may feel about that, this is their experience. And if you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. And I respect that. I respect that a lot because you know the experience that you're getting for your iPhone is that from Apple and Apple alone, without no other interference at all. You don't have to worry about the fact that AT&T may want to put their custom software. They want to prevent you from getting certain updates. They may want to put certain apps on your phone. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that from Verizon. You don't have to worry about that from any carrier whatsoever. When you get your iPhone, your iPhone is going to work the way it's intended to work. And when it's time for a software update, all of the iPhones get it, no matter whether it's the newest iPhone or the oldest iPhone. Apple is kicking out a software update, and you can go get it, and no one's going to interfere with that. And really, that is what we have been looking for on a Google phone for years. And I will admit to this. We pretty much got that with the Google Pixel. Now, unfortunately, with the Google Pixel, it's like a three or four years after three or four years, they stop stopped updating it. It's not like the iPhone where Apple just continued to update it regardless until the phone no longer is able to function, they're going to continue to update that. But for a lot of us, we're okay with, we'll give you three. You give me three or four years, for most people, we're not going more than three or four years with the same phone. So we were willing to accept that, and I'm okay with that. And on the software end, as far as us getting the updates and getting the security patches like we're supposed to, I'll give Google that. They're doing a good job on that, and check mark there. That's what they're doing right, uh, doing right. But as far as the overall experience, that is not where we're at. And this is where I say we still do not have a true Pixel or a true iPhone competitor because when you look at what you're getting for the iPhone, even though the iPhone's expensive, you can see where your money is going. You can see that, okay, you got one of the top hardware experiences. The cameras are good. The build quality is top-notch. Yeah, I may not agree with the pricing, but you at least getting something that justifies what you're paying for. I don't quite feel that with the Pixel 4. It is not the best Android phone or Android experience that you can get. It's not. You can get a better Android experience on other phones than you can on Pixel. And this is where I'm like, we're four phones in and we still don't have the best Android experience we can get on a Pixel. It can be much better. Now, don't mistake the fact that we're getting updates timely, we're getting, you know, um, security updates for the best Android experience. 
No, we're getting that, but we're not getting the best Android experience. We're not. You cannot tell people that Pixel 3 and 3XL, you're getting the best Android experience. In fact, I don't think you can tell people on a brand new Pixel 4 and Pixel 4XL you're getting the best Android experience. And the reason why I say that, because how can a company who just dropped $2.1 billion on Fitbit, who have the money, going to tell customers to go out there and buy this brand new $1,000 phone where when you look at the hardware and you stack it up with other manufacturers out there that are putting phones out there at a cheaper price, it's not even on the same level as far as hardware level. But you're making, or not making, but you're telling these customers to go out there and spend that type of money for this phone and you know that this phone has software issues that you could have dropped a software update on day one when they bought it. But yet, you're going to tell these customers, go out there and buy this phone, and we'll fix your phone later. And we're not talking about little things. If it was just something minor, like, okay, you know, a minor brightness issue or something like that we know about, okay. We're talking about things like security issues, where someone can literally take your phone, and while you sleep, unlock your phone and buy something. This is a, a major security flaw that is on this phone. And you're telling these customers out there, buy my phone and we'll get to updating it when we get to it. Hopefully around November, December sometime. Oh, but you're going to still pay this premium for this phone. No. And that's why for me, I cannot tell someone to buy this phone. You know, I actually had a coworker, and they know I'm a fan of the Pixel phone. I, I've been riding the Pixel coattail for years. You know, you know, they know where I stand when it comes to these phones. You know, um, people out there, I got a note, man. Nah, nah, the Pixels, where is that? Because it's the only pure Android experience you can get. And to be honest with you, I had to drop my head in shame last year when I recommended to a person, hey, you need to get a Pixel 3. That's the phone you need to get. And we started having memory, the same memory dump issues I'm having, battery issues I'm having. And I'm like, man, I can, I feel like bad because I gave this guy bad advice. And I don't like giving anyone bad advice, especially when it comes to tech. And I'm like, someone came up to me and said, hey, man, a Pixel 4 out. Should I buy it? No, bro. In fact, I'm not even buying it, not on day one. And here's the reason why you shouldn't. And there's no way I'm going to tell someone to go out there and spend that type of money for that phone with those issues. Without the hardware, that should be backing up. And what I'm saying is, again, this is Google that just spent $2.1 billion on Fitbit. And if OnePlus can manage to find a way to put the type of hardware in their phones, if Asus can find a way to be able to put the kind of hardware in their gaming phones, there are a number of other manufacturers out there that's not making nowhere near as much money as Google, that find a way to put the amount of hardware they need to on their phone and sell them at a cheaper price than a Pixel. And you're going to tell me that Google could not have put out a, a Pixel with at least close to the hardware spec that these other manufacturers are putting out there to justify their $1,000 price point? But I'm not going to co-sign that. I'm not. I am not going to tell not one person to go out there and spend their money on something like that. We're not talking about a, a manufacturer that couldn't do better. And you can't keep giving Google excuses because they know better. They know better because of this. They partner with all of these hardware companies. They provide the software experience for each one of them. They know what the trends are. They know the, the hardware, the, the specs, and all these metrics that you need to know to kind of get an idea of what is pulled and using this software. They have that information. We're not again. We're not talking about you know someone else. We're talking about the manufacturer who creates the software for these other manufacturers to run their hardware on, so they know who's using their software, so they know better. And so that this is why I, I'm, I'm not going to give them an excuse. This is about why I'm not going to sit there and tell someone you know what you know this is okay or. You need to look at it from this angle. No, there's no other angle to look for. The way you want to look at it is with your wallet. You know, don't don't pay for that. Don't don't allow that kind of behavior to continue on. The best way 
you send a signal to a company, it's by not buying their product. You buy the competitor product. You say, look, if you're not going to give me the hardware experience to match the software experience that I'm looking for from your phone, that goes somewhere else. And you need to. You know, because, again, Google know better. But what they're trying to do, they, they do what they continue to do. They could do much better because we've seen Google do a, a, a stellar job when they want to. When Google's willing to go all out, when Google's really about their game, they can do some awesome stuff. I, it's why, for me, I gravitated to Android and a lot of Google software because at, when they're on their game, they can be one of the best in the business. But that's when they're on their game. But there's a lot of time where Google is willing to just kind of melt it in, half step it. And lately with the Pixel phones, they've been half stepping it a lot, a lot. You know, <laughs> there have not been one Pixel they put out smooth. And I'm tired of sitting there and of sitting there seeing people saying, oh, man, it's OK. This is good about it. This is the one thing. You nah. Nah, I'm not going to be that person that's going to uh, ride the coattail and say, it, it, it's good to go. We all right. Look at it from this angle. Ah, you don't need all that. You mean you don't need all that? I just spent $1,000 for a phone. What do you mean I don't need all that? $1,000 for a phone that I, I'm going to leave something on the table? Man, come on. Nah, nah, nah. I'm going to keep it real for you. I'm not going to... I'm not going to sit there and let someone uh, jump on a phone or spend their hard-earned money for something that is not living up to what it needs to. Man, that's not going to happen. You know, I like you, I work hard for my money. And I'm going to give you the upfront, legit ordeal about this. You know, if I'm not willing to spend my hard-earned money for it <laughs> on opening day, I'm not going to tell someone else to because it just it's just not worth it. And again, you look at the things that Google put out that have been, you know, stellar. You know, YouTube TV. I, I, I love YouTube TV. I, I continue to preach that. Hey, that is the one thing that core cutter. If you're a core cutter, you want cable, YouTube TV is the way to go. You know, I don't like the latest price hike they did, but I still preach YouTube TV. Chromecast, you know. Again, you don't need to go out there and buy a smart TV. In fact, I actually go out there and look for a way to buy a, a TV without smart features because I'm okay with putting a little Chromecast in the back of it and casting everything. So Chromecast, I, I love that for what it does. Google Assistant, for the most part, is really good. Android, this operating system in general, Android has been a success for Google. And YouTube, we all pretty much know how successful YouTube is. You know, even though they, again, people have some issues with, um, especially content creators on the way to, uh, YouTube kind of, uh, punish, uh, content creators for certain things. But YouTube, for the most part, have been a successful platform. But then we know that Google have failed hard on some things, such as Google Plus. But again, where it comes to their Pixel phones and, you know, really their Wear OS as well. They just been, they just been skating by and hoping that they can make a profit by giving the minimal hardware effort as possible and say that, you know what, we don't need the, the hardware. We're going to be like Apple on this one. We're going to put about less hardware. We're going to prove that we can match up when it comes to software. Now, if Google was able to do that, if Google was able to put out a phone where their numbers perform just as well as something like a, a Note 10 or a OnePlus or better hardware, then I would say, you know what? Google proved their point. Good job. They were able to put out an experience on a phone that was able to match up with these other manufacturers that with less hardware. This is why I buy their phone. But the problem is they haven't been able to do it. And the issues that have been coming up for their phone have been proven to be because they've been skimming out on this hardware side. Had they add this, they could have provided a better experience. And after seeing the latest um, video by Unbox, not Unbox 30, um, J-Rig, everything that shows that the latest Pixel as far as durability goes, man, it, it, again, the Pixel 4, I feel like, is a bust. You know, right now, the Pixel 4 is a bust. And the Pixel 4 XL is not that far from it. With everything that's out there, 
We're four Pixel phones in, and we still yet have a true iPhone competitor. And really, I don't think we have a true Pixel success, uh, successful Pixel phone. And it's sad when the most successful or the best Pixel phone that's been out to date had been a Pixel 2 XL, and that's the phone that came out with the display issues and tent gate. Who would have known that phone would have been the best Pixel phone that Google have ever put out thus far? And my rant over with Google. I went 30 minutes ranting on Google and their Pixel, and I'm kind of done with it. And, and I'm kind of hoping that they don't repeat the same mistake when it comes to the Google Stadium because, you know, I'm expecting to get my, my controller shipped out pretty soon, and I'm kind of hoping that the Stadia actually live up to the hype. And, you know, I'm not a gamer, you know, but I'm actually on the Discord with a bunch of gamers. And when I asked them about Google and their Stadia and, and what their thoughts on it, a lot of gamers, they're not really feeling it, you know. And, and this is just this, this Discord. So there could be other Discord where people are excited about it. But just this particular Discord where, you know, these are small YouTubers that have gaming channels. And when I asked them their th thoughts on a Google Stadia, for the most part, most of them either don't know what it is or don't care about it. And when I brought up the concept, they're like, yeah, they don't see it as worth looking into. So the question is, can they actually live up to what they're saying? And if so, if they could get people on board to, to really be excited about it. And honestly, I think, again, when it first come out, you know, you're going to have excitement among those that um, bought it at first. Um, but like any Google product, it's going to have some issues when it first come out. And the question is going to be, can they fix those issues as quick as possible to be able to get more people wanting to jump on board? Because if these issues continue to lag on and the people that would early adopt to start saying, you know what, I don't like it. They start getting bad reviews. They start dropping it. Um, they start telling people don't waste their time, don't waste their money. It's going to be dead on arrival. And it's going to be hard to get everybody else to jump on board because, again, what you got to do is out of the bat, you have to get those that decided to spend that money, the founders group, that people that say, I want to be a founder, the founders edition package. You got to get those guys excited from the jump. You got to get those guys on Twitter. You got to get these guys on YouTube. You got these guys, got to get these guys out there saying, this is the truth. You got to get these guys willing to put that information out there and get other people hyped. You got to. Because if you don't, if you lose your founders, you lose it all. Period. And you got to capitalize on this. And I, I think Google understands that. They're going to have a Reddit next week um, where they're again going to ask and field more questions and try to get people hyped up for the upcoming Stadia where they have the games and titles to... You get people uh, ready to go or ready to um, to jump on board, and will it perform the way they expected it, and the way customers expect? And here's going to be the most telling thing that needs to happen: they're going to have problems, and that's just with anything that comes out new. There's going to be issues. There's going to be problems. There's going to be hiccups. It's how well they able to solve the problem. And get people up, up gaming and get everything working will decide whether or not they will be successful or not. Not a, a smooth start because no matter what you have, you're going to have a hiccup. Is whether you have the right people in place that's going to be patient, that's going to be around, is going to be able to get things done. When a gamer have a problem, to get them back up and running and make sure their problem is solved as soon as possible. Are you going to have that on standby, ready to go? Because if you don't, if you don't have the support system, if you don't have anything in place to fix the problems that will come up, it's going to, it's going to fail. And that's going to be one of the things that needs to be looked into. And I'm actually kind of, I'm kind of have a lukewarm feeling about whether Google will have the support staff ready to go. If you would have asked me before a couple weeks ago, my thoughts on whether Google had the support staff, I would say, yep. At the end of the day, Google had one of the best support staff ever right up there with Apple. But recently, 
after the issue I had with I um with the well, I had a recent issue with a Google Pixel that I bought, and I had to go to their support staff. And then dealing with them, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know if, and I could have maybe got a, a bad group of people, but yeah, I don't really feel like Google will have that staff that's ready to go. Not anymore. And the reason why I'm saying that, because before that happened with my issue, I've been reading people saying, man, Google support staff is garbage. And I've been wanting to say, like, come on now, I'm not having any problem with them. They're pretty good. And then I experienced it. And I'm like, wow, maybe they went downhill. So this is going to be something that if they can't get this fixed, will be a deciding factor whether or not it's going to stick around. And I don't know. I really don't know where this is going to go. I don't know which a heap is going to be at. Is this going to be one of those things that's going to be a, be the next success? Is this going to be up there with the Chromecast, the YouTube TV, the Google Assistant, Android, YouTube? Is it going to be in that pile? Is this going to be the latest successful thing that Google put out there? Or is it going to be in a pile of the Google Plus where it gets scrapped? But worse, I think worse than the, the scrap pile, I mean, don't get me wrong, if you scrap, you're done. But worse than the scrap pile is being in the middle, that middle ground where it's like the Google Pixel and the Android OS, uh, Wear OS. If you're in that area where you're still around and the excitement continues to dwindle and it dwindle and it dwindle because you're not putting out the latest and greatest. I mean, I mean, you, you started out hot, you started out fast, you started out getting people excited, but then you begin to show yourself. You then stop providing that same energy, that same energy level. You stop providing that same support. You stop giving people a reason to care anymore. I think that's the worst heat to be in. And that's kind of really where I am at with the Pixel, who I've already been at with Wear OS. And this will suck if Google get there with the Stadia. Because that's the worst area to be at with that. Because if you're there... That's pretty much like you might well be dead. So we'll see how that goes. So for my last quick topic before we roll up out, you know, T-Mobile Sprint merger is about to be approved. You know, we keep talking about, oh, man, this merger about to be approved, but it looks like it's pretty much done. And, you know, coming in December, they're going to roll out their 600 megahertz 5G. And, you know, Google, not Google, uh, T-Mobile been talking about that. They're going to put out a, a special edition one plus seven pro that's going to a 7t pro that's going to be 5g ready to go and it, actually i've been excited about that phone i've been looking forward to it i didn't know one thing that's really keep me from wanting to pick that up is i uh, read a, a read um, read an article that said that one plus is not going to release it with uh android q out of the box and you know for me i'm like well um <laughs> It needs to have the latest update, and OnePlus, for um, the most part, have been pretty good about putting out Android. I can say Android 10, but Android 10 um, have been doing good about putting the latest update for some of their phones, particularly the OnePlus 7 Pro. So this could have me worry. If if the article and the rumors end up being true that the OnePlus 7 T Pro 5G don't get Android 10 until later on it, because T-Mobile basically controlling that software experience, then I, I'm not going to want to jump on board. You know, again, one of the things I do not like, I do not like when carriers get in the way of software updates because if, if that starts off that way, it's going to be continue to, continue to be a problem. And I'm concerned about that because, again, it's, it's going to be a special edition T-Mobile phone. It's not coming from OnePlus, which means all your software updates are going to come possibly through T-Mobile, and that's the case, I may never see a, a, a quick software update. So I am concerned about that, and that's going to be the one thing that keeps me uh, really looking whether or not I should buy it or not. So I'm going to be keeping up on that information there. Now, let's talk about the 600 megahertz 5G, because again, I was at the 5G conference in LA. I was kind of getting looking into really 5G and what we kind of expect and so this 600 megahertz 5G that's coming is going to feel more like a boosted LTE, meaning look, it's going to be your LTE speed boosted up. So, and, and for a lot of people, for the average people, you guys are going to get hyped up about it. You're going to look at your phone like, whoa, buddy, I'm pulling out some good speeds. And you're, you're going to have some 
smooth experience. I think you're gonna be able to enjoy um, Netflix, just fine, YouTube, music, all the things that you use your phone for. You're gonna be able to be good with it. And the simple fact that uh, these carriers cap off your um, your resolution for when you watch YouTube and Netflix and all that stuff to like a certain level, you're gonna be fine. And for a lot of you guys, you're gonna feel like you're getting the best experience. You know, your apps are going to be loading like you want it faster. And people are going to be so excited about it. They're going to be willing to pay that little extra. And I think T-Mobile will use that to help fund their uh, building of the true 5G. And we will eventually get true 5G the way we want it. So boosted LTE, which they call it 5G, which is coming out, is going to really be a success for a lot of people. I think a lot of people are going to jump on board. Because really, if you look at where we at with LTE, LTE is fast. We get what we want out of LTE. You know, I'm able to watch my shows on the go. I really have no complaints over LTE. I think for the most part, for a lot of us, we just want some of the dead areas to kind of have a, a better overall experience where, you know, when I go into a store or I go into wherever I go into a building, I'm not having to drop off of my speeds or I'm not having things slowing down. I want basically to be able to have... Um, Basically, a, a consistent experience when it comes to my speeds. And if you get that with boosted LTE, which, again, 5G, most people going to be okay with that. And they're going to be willing to pay a little bit more. And by a little bit more, 5 or $10 extra more. Now, they get too crazy with it. People going to pretty much like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. So, yeah, I, I think you know people going to be excited about it. They're going to get the people hyped up about it. It's going to work. Now, as far as the true LTE, Oh, I'm sorry, the true 5G. Verizon, I think, gonna be the first and really the only company out of the gate that's gonna put out true 5G. And you're gonna get the true 5G experience with a thousand up, a thousand down. The problem is that, again, with 5G, the uh, high frequency that they're trying to put out there, um, it's gonna require a lot more hardware. It's gonna require a lot more time to build it out. And really, this kind of mirrors what, what Verizon did with LTE. You know, they took their time, they built it out there, they got things put in position, and they did it right the first time. And, you know, kudos to them. Now, as much as, you know, Verizon to me is not the carrier, you know, I would go to, you know, um, anymore because of their pricing, I do give it to them this. You know, they do do it right when it comes to building out their, their infrastructure, and they, and they do it right the first time. And they're willing to take their time, they're willing to go in certain areas and build that out properly the way it needs to be built out and then move to the next area. And I think they will be the first to have true 5G the way it needs to be. And when you want the, the fastest experience, they're going to be the way to go. Now, as far as overall, because this is the one thing that Verizon, you know, did have an issue with. So Verizon was the first to go to true LTE and build it out properly. But the problem is when you went from uh, LTE back to their 3G, there was such a big drop off where it felt like, man, you knew you was on LTE. And that really the issue I had when I had like a phone like my Galaxy Nexus, which, you know, the LTE radius were garbage and it kept wanting to go back to, I had to rely on 3G because their 3G speeds were so slow compared to how good the LTE speeds, you felt that drop off and you like, man, you knew when you wasn't on LTE. So when you had those areas that were dead spots for Verizon, you felt that. You felt that drop off. Or if you went in an area where the, the tower was congested and you had to drop to a, a, a 3G to get your stuff to go through, you felt it. And this is where AT&T and T-Mobile kind of, you know, even in being with them being slow and building out their, their information or their infrastructure, kind of did better than Verizon. So AT&T, even though I hate the way they went out with calling it 4G, um, they first built out the HSPA Plus, which was a boosted 3G, making it a little bit faster. And then when they did build out the LTE event, finally, you know, when you went from LTE to HSPA Plus, it was a drop-off, but not as much of a drop-off as it was from going from LTE to 3G. And I think this is what we're going to see mirrored again when it comes to Verizon and these other carriers. Verizon is going to come out out of the bat, and they're going to have their 5G built properly at the proper speeds. But when you go from true 5G back to LTE, you're going to feel that drop. And that's going to feel like customers are losing out, and they're going to have 
uh, complaints and anger, not right, anger, but a little frustration that, man, I really wish there wasn't that big of a drop off. Even though when you look at LTE, it's, it's still pretty fast. But again, when you have that big drop off from a thousand up, thousand down back to, let's say, 20 or, let's see, at the most 100 up, 100 down, you'll feel that drop off. Whereas what T Mobile and I don't know if AT and T going to do it properly, but let's just say T Mobile for right now. T Mobile Sprint building out that 600 megahertz, where they're going to have that nice little buffer zone that going to have a lot of people in that area where they get the boosted LTE. So they finally do get the LTE and they step up. You know, it's like a, you're, you're millimeter stepping up, and if you have an issue where you have a tower congested and you got to drop back down. That drop in speed is not as drastic, so you don't feel it as much, and you're not complaining about it as much. And at the end of the day, I think this is going to be how this is mirrored. And, you know, who's going to be the most successful at it? You know, um, as far as who's going to get the credit for being the most successful early on? Verizon, you know, because they're going to do it right the first time. But customers, you know, that's going to stick with the T-Mobile and stick with the other, they're going to see that, this is going to hopefully pan out like they want, and they're going to get the experience that they hope to get on 5G. And the biggest thing is going to be is how the carriers go about pricing this, and this is going to be the challenge here, and how they're going to handle it. And what we're going to do now that we have, um, or we no longer are um, getting our internet undisturbed for the most part, you know, um, yeah, you know, are, are we going to see where we're going to have more of tier data? Are we going to have tiers to different internet packages? Or are they going to tier T-Mobile a certain way or whatever? And this is something that I, I am concerned about. And, you know, um, now that, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, now that, you know, net neutrality has pretty much been axed out, you know, and, and clearly companies can go out there and they can now decide, how you know you use the internet potentially you know they could actually decide if netflix will be capped a certain way or charged a certain way or receive certain speeds versus maybe another uh, provider out there if it's something like their own if netflix is not willing to play ball with a certain company or you know i talked about that last week we could see that become you know something that May be a problem for for users and customers, and you know as we continue to kind of see how five G continue to get built out and how this overall gets, you know, pushed out to the customers and the overall experience. You know, we'll get an idea of what to expect. And look, I'm be keeping my ears to the ground, and you know, I'm I've looked at or subscribed to the the new five G or the new T Mobile. That's what they call it. The new team over Twitter. I'm looking forward to seeing what else they're putting out there. Yeah, out of the bat, they're getting people excited, talking about the uh, the new team mobile and how they're going to provide services for emergency services as well as provide for the underprivileged and basically they're saying the things that's going to get people excited and jumping on board. And yeah, I'm kind of curious to see. This quote, 5G for good, it, obviously, it, it, we know what it's for. It, it, it's basically, they're trying to find a way to make sure regulators understand that we want to push this through. And, yeah, and they, and I'm looking forward to seeing what this new T-Mobile Uncarry 1.0 is going to be and waiting to see what all they're going to do with it and see how well this end up going. And will they truly be able to have a, or be a competitor to, Verizon AT and T out there and provide a better experience, and how will it play out to our bills when it comes time to make the payments every day or every week, every month? When we do our monthly payments, we got to mail off that check, or we got to go online and and make that payment. Is it going to be where we're seeing us paying more and more and more, or are we going to get more? from the carriers for what we already pay them for. And this is going to be something that we get to see gets paying out. And now that we're this new T-Mobile, are we finally going to get a T-Mobile infrastructure that rivals that of AT&T and T-Mobile or AT&T and Verizon? 
Because let's be honest, one of the things that I will say that as much as I don't like AT&T or Verizon, especially Verizon, it works. You know, for the most part, it works. You go indoors, it works. You go to this place, it works. It works. You know, you don't have too many dead zones with Verizon. And that's what I'm hoping we can get with T-Mobile and Sprint now that they're merged. Pretty much officially. Now that we're here, all we're going to get experience that really rivals that of the top two. And at what price? Anyway, that's all I got for you this week with the Next Up podcast. I look forward to hearing from you guys on your thoughts on today's topics. For you, like me, who are fans of the Google phones, do you feel like we finally will ever get a true competitive iPhone? And are you disappointed with how far we are from being there with the current Pixel phones? Where do you think Stadia will end up? Is it going to be in the heap of successful Google products and software? Is it going to eventually die down to be like Google Plus and be the failures? Or will it be the mediocre? The one that has so much potential. But don't provide what it could. And at the end of the result, it might as well be in purgatory for fans like myself. Lastly, we're here. 5G is here. This T-Mobile Sprint thing is pretty much here. Where are we going to go with it? Is it something to look forward to? Or... Is it going to be another carrier making all these promises to get hype while on the back end finding ways to pull more money out your pocket? Look forward to your comments. You can hit me up at PC747 at thenextup.com or on Twitter. Thank you yet again. Enjoy your weekend. Some college football for those of you who are sports fans. Your work week. Hope you all have a good work week. And I look forward to continue talking tech with you next week on the Next Up podcast. That's all I have. I'm out.